Good morning for those who are um, coming in late. Thanks for the introduction, Olivier. That was actually perfect setup what I'm going to talk about. Um, I will show you that security visualization is actually really freaking hard. And how I'm going to do that is I'm using heat maps as an example to motivate why it's so really, really so hard. So heat maps are these kinds of things. They look very simple, right? You have rows of columns. You, you see certain patterns in here. I'm going to show you why visualizing this is actually really hard. But first, why would we want to do this? You, in the previous presentation, you basically saw how visualization was used for communicating information, right? You show the campaigns in the different visualizations. That's sort of the last point here. What I'm very interested in is doing data discovery and finding interesting things in the data itself that you didn't know about before. So really exploring and doing data discovery. Finding intruders or new kinds of attacks um, before they're known or before you know that they hit your networks. Well, what that really means is I have to be able to visualize more than a terabyte of data, right? Because I look at my environment, I collect all my net flows, my IDS data, AV, operating systems, proxies, you name it. I need to look at all of that data, make sense of it somehow. Well, if you try to visualize a lot of data, take one of those link graphs, what you get is a hairball, right? And you have seen them in actuality, they look something like this. It's fairly useless to analyze. So that already shows you it's really freaking hard. Well, there's probably other types of visualizations you could use instead of link graphs. Link graphs are horrible at scalability, right? If you throw uh, 100,000 nodes into one of those graphs, you get the hairball. Well, you can use something else. You can use a pie chart. Pie charts are probably very horrible as well. Y you don't really see that much information in there, right? If you look at one aspect of the data, there's not much information there. If you look at a bar graph, maybe it's a little better. You can take the link graphs, again, they don't scale that well. You can try something like the tree map that Olivier also was showing briefly that you can probably pack more information in there. Or you use something like a parallel coordinate on the bottom right, and that probably in all of these visualizations has the highest information content of what I'm showing you here. But it's still very limited. Try a, try a, uh, a parallel coordinate with a million records, which is not that much, right? You collect a million records in a few hours in an environment. Um, so again, probably not the best scalability. Well, what are we doing? What I'm proposing is using heat maps. Heat maps are nothing else than matrices, right? It's, uh, I have a fancy way of showing the matrix here in a mathematical forms. You have rows and columns. In the end, what we're trying to generate is on the right-hand side. So you take every value in the matrix and you assign it a color value. Here I use the gradient of, of sort of white to blue. Uh, if it's 10 or if it's 1 to 10, it's white. If it's 80 to or over 90, it's a, it's a very dark blue, for example. So very simple mapping. If you map um, things in here, usually what I use is columns are usually time. So going to the right, you go into the future. In, this, in the rows here, what I'm showing you here in this example is source IP addresses. And then every value here is just for a certain time slice, how many times did I see that source IP? Fairly simple. How do you map a log record now? Well, here's a typical sudo. Um, on my, on my box, uh, I have a timestamp there. I have um, the user that was doing it. So what you do is you take the timestamp, you figure out what bin it goes into. And what I'm doing is I basically built these time bins of, of, of certain sizes where the, ma the, the event is getting mapped into. Right? So I, I don't have an individual column for every timestamp, but I, I use bins um, to aggregate them. Then you use the row, and wherever it intersects, you, for example, add one or you use some kind of a function to update the color value there. So that's still pretty straightforward. Now, why would you use heat maps? Well, they actually scale incredibly well. I can throw a terabyte of data into this kind of thing and visualize it here. Um, they show more information in a bar chart, right? As, as Olivier was also saying when he showed the scalability axis on the right, the bar charts, they, they scale really well, but the problem is the information content is very low. You don't see that much information in there. Heat maps are slightly better. And then what you can also do here is you can do multiple measures. What I can do in every data point in here could either be just a count of how many times did I see that thing, or if you have a numerical value, you can say, well, 
show me the average number of bytes transmitted at that time, for example, right? So if I have IP addresses on the rows, you have time, then every dot could be how many bytes on average should it transmit. So the more bytes were transmitted by an IP address, the brighter it would get, for example. You can also say, well, um, I'm doing a distinct count on some other value. So every data point here could be, if I use users on my rows, I can say, well, how many different machines did they go to in a certain time frame? So I see suddenly, I see all my users that are accessing a lot of different machines, for example. And that should usually, usually that's probably your system administrators and not your salespeople, hopefully. So that's pretty powerful, but still the information content is fairly limited, right? I can't show all the aspects of my data. If I look at my data, I have users and IPs and ports and bytes transmitted and all that kind of stuff. I still can't show all of that in there. Um, so what are we doing? Well, there's a, a gentleman con uh, called Ben Schneiderman. He's a, or used to be a professor at the University of Maryland. He's also the inventor of the tree maps. And he said at some point, there's a paradigm where you first need to generate an overview of your data. Then you zoom and filter. And then you, you go and look at the details on demand if you actually want to understand exactly what happened, right? You might go back to your packet captures or net flows to actually dig in exactly what happened. So um, how that looks, right? You generate an overview, and you could use a heat map for that. You look at a certain area that looks interesting. You take the zoom and uh, filter. You go to, for example, a, a link graph. Now you have much less information you can actually show. And then from there, you might find interesting patterns, and you go to your details. I think pretty straightforward. Now, again, I'm motivating that I would use a heat map for my overview, because, again, I can pack millions of records in here. I already, in the heat map itself, I can start zooming in. So I'm getting a great way of already leveraging the heat map itself for that first zoom step to kind of get an idea of my data itself. It also has the capability that I can actually expose certain patterns right away in the heat map itself, right? I might see certain interesting patterns in the data right away. And it also allows me, uh, it's sort of a starting point for going into other visualizations so I can take a certain area and then go off into a parallel coordinate or a link graph or a tree map or something like that. And really no other visualization possesses these qualities. So what I'm going to show you now is I think I hope I motivated a little bit why heat maps are the right way to sort of get that overview and it's a starting point for your analysis. I want to show you now that even something as simple as the heat map, when you start implementing it, has a whole lot of challenges. The first one is very simple. This is an example of a lot of records. I think this is the, um, the Syrian proxy logs, if anyone is familiar with that data set. Um, if you want labels, if you want to know what the rows actually are, well, how do I do this here? I have over a thousand rows visible here. I can't even draw the labels in there, right? So at what point do I actually show them? And if I don't show them, well, is it still useful? The second one is a very simple one. Well, I'm a little more zoomed in here, and I want to have a sort of a mouse over. What, it, what does it display? Does it actually just show me the coordinates, meaning um, right now, I might be on the second IP address, or here, actually, I'm using um, names of the records. So the row is the DNS update request, and the column, my time bin, is, is the, there's a start and end time in there. It's formatted a little strangely here. Um, and then I also show the value underneath, just what the actual color value basically is. Well, that's one way to do it, but might not be the best way to do it. Maybe I want to see what actual records were summarized in there. Well, the problem now is, am I going to do real-time requests back to the back end to get those records back? Well, if I do, you need to be, have a very, very powerful back end because you might have a few terabytes stored in there. And when I start moving my mouse around and I stop somewhere, you start going query that, you have to have a really nice big data back end to actually pull the right data back. Then probably the biggest challenge is sorting of the rows. How do you want to sort this thing? Well, you can just have it randomly sorted, and then you won't see the patterns, really. Because if, let's say, I'm using usernames, right, on my rows, I have all my users. If I sort them alphabetically, there's no inherent structure just because my name starts with an R and, and 
you have Jeff and, and Andrew and whoever, it, there's no inherent ordering there, so I'm not going to see any in interesting patterns there. Um, well, I could try to do it based on the values. So I actually look at the colors, and I try to order them th that way. That might be interesting. But then, if you look at similarities, how do you actually, um, what algorithms are you going to use to sort of cluster things by similarity? And how do you define a distance metric? So whenever you do a clustering, you need to define what it actually means if two points are close to each other, right? Any, any way you do that. Um, so how do you define whether two users are close to each other? Well, you could look at their role. In my network, well, this is a salesperson, an engineer, a system administrator. You can cluster based on that if you want. Um, the example you see here, on the left-hand side, I'm showing sort of a random order. On the right-hand side, I clustered it by the row values, right? So you start seeing that the darker parts are sort of clustered together. This was a very simple approach. You use R for this. You run the heat map um, command, and you just tell it to cluster. The problem here is that the thing's actually split into two. I have a top row that's dark, and I have a bottom row. So it seems like the algorithm somehow split my data set into two, but I really want them to be together, right? Because the top row looks like the bottom row. Why is that not clustered together? And that's a whole set of problems you, you start getting when you go, get into the data mining space. And this is a field called seriation. And it's actually not easy. How do you do that efficiently? And how do you define these distance matrices? Then let's assume you have 100,000 rows you want to show. I don't have a display with 100,000 rows. I don't have enough pixels to actually show that. Well, I have to overplot. So I have to aggregate different rows into one row. How am I going to do that now? Well. There's all kinds of different ways. You can say I'm just summing multiple rows and I sum up the values, or maybe average it, and I show that. Well, now you just lost information. So certain patterns might not be visible anymore. Then that that's sort of the static rendering of this thing. Now you want to make it interactive. Well, there's a whole bunch of other challenges here. How do you select time when you show the, the, the heat map? So what's the left end and what's the right end? Well, I can just show all of my data, but potentially I have to query, I don't know, a petabyte of data or however much you have. Even if it's just a terabyte, try to scan a terabyte on disk. It's going to take you a while. Um, and then do I actually let the user um, choose a start time and an end time? So assume the user picks a start time and an end time and it's a, a thousand and three seconds that he that he chose for whatever reason, right? Well, but I, I have a thousand pixels to show something. How do I do that? I have three pixels that don't really fit in. Am I just going to scale everything down and I, I show one point zero zero three pixels per or uh, values per pixel? How does that going to work? Do I have to sample for that? Like, not sure. Um, so this is sort of the the time challenge. Then. If you zoom in, so you have a certain area, you want to zoom into that here, shown by this um, red rectangle here. I zoom in. Well, if you go to a certain detail level, your, your, um, your data here, these blocks become really big, right? Every individual square here gets bigger and bigger. Well, at some point, I might want to re-query the back end because I might have more detail for the data because I aggregated it before. So at that point, do I go and re-query the data and get actually more detail? And how do I do that exactly? Then color. How do I map my color scheme? Right Before I showed you a sort of a white to a blue. That's sort of the default I'm using for most of my visualizations here. But there's other ways. I can have discrete mappings for certain values. I can have continuous mappings. Maybe I have rainbow scales and all kinds of other things. What's the most effective one here? Exposure is another. The, the two heat maps on the right are the same data, but with different exposure levels. Uh, on the top, you see uh, sort of that one row that's sort of highlighted. But then on the bottom, I change my exposure level. So it's still the same data, but I'm basically changing the mapping. Instead of having a linear mapping, for example, I start moving it a little to the left because I have way too many sl small values, so I'm giving them a little more color space. So suddenly, I see other patterns in here. So don't forget that. Then if I do a zoom in on my data, right? I, I zoom in on one row that looks interesting. Well, now I have sort of this one-dimensional 
data I'm looking at. Okay, over time I see sort of how that thing was active. How now I want to know like what source, or if this is the destination address, right? Like how does that look across sources? So let me pivot on my data, use that zoom in where I'm at, but now pivot and show me the sources for that, for example. So that's another thing I want to enable here. I probably could go on and inter interactivity. These are just a few things you have to think through when you do this. The next step is, well, what's the data backend for this kind of thing? Well, obviously big data as we, I guess yesterday, Felix, I'm not sure what it's called now. It's not big data anymore. It's something else. Um, there's different technologies. You have key value stores. You have search engines. You have graph databases, relational databases. MySQL might work just fine for a lot of these cases, by the way. Hadoop is not the right thing to do here, by the way. Don't use MapReduce to, kind of to produce these heat maps because you're not scanning all of the data, and Hadoop is really good at that. You want to use a columnar data store for this kind of stuff. But then try find me a good columnar data store that's open source. Um, think about caching and different layers, right? You want to make this fast. I don't want to go to the back end all the time and pull a terabyte of data back. Interesting challenges here. Well. I keep advocating that heat maps, are, heat maps are great, but for certain things, they're just not. Um, you have, if you want to see relationship between different things, you probably want to use a link graph. If you want to see multiple dimensions at the same time, probably a parallel coordinate is great because you can have multiple different dimensions in here. Um, so I hope I, I showed you heat maps are really, there's a lot to think about when you generate them. And those are simple kinds of visualizations, right? I, I think everybody understands how they look. Now try to imagine what other visualizations, how hard it is with them. What's the interactivity on link graphs? When you hover, what do you see? Do you, like what he was showing all of you earlier in the demo, it was highlighted in node and all the edges and all the connected nodes. Well, is that the right way to do it? Maybe you have larger chains you want to show. You want to show the shortest path between different things and so on. Um, so heat maps might be a good starting point, but um, maybe not the best. Maybe you want to start with something else, even earlier. Maybe you want to use some kind of data mining. There's a lot of clustering algorithms out there. One clustering method is self-organizing maps. That's what I'm showing you here. This is um, the example here that you're seeing. These are 50 million records across um, 25 different dimensions. It basically clusters different things in here and shows you groups of machines and what I can do now is, if I look at that over time, I might see that clusters change. So I see my mail servers and my web servers. And over time, my clusters might grow, or they might shift slightly in those self-organizing maps. And I know something has changed in my environment. And that might be something I want to drill into and look at that difference, for example. So there might be a different way to start with that overview instead of using a heat map. All right, I have a bunch of examples here, but also not much time. So that's why I'm going to skip over a couple of those. You can, I will publish the slides. Um, uh, this is a funny one. By the way, this is not, I did not generate this. I got this from my friends in Norway. Um, these two guys here that show up as the image, they were the guys, they scanned the firewall in a certain way, and they knew that the person looking at the firewall logs was visualizing them in this way. So they showed themselves in here. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, one very quick end-to-end -end way of how would you use a, he a heat map to actually look at something, right? What I'm showing you here are destination addresses on the rows. So you see, okay, interesting, there might be something happening here. I can start looking and try to find patterns. If I actually know what the different IPs are, maybe I see a pattern right away that's like, hang on, why is this machine communicating like this? What I did then is I changed my exposure on here, right? Remember, you can change exposure on these on the, uh, the levels here. I mean, you might see there suddenly this pattern emerged. It looks very periodic. That's interesting. Now, I want to zoom in here, and then what I want to do is I want to see. So if I actually so I zoom into this this one nine four two four two twenty two. I hope no one is here that owns that address space. Um, what I do then is I pivot on the source addresses now, right? So the same for that, for those destinations, I want to now know who actually generated that traffic. So I see now the sources that generated that. Any patterns we see in here? <sighs> kind of hard, right? Well, 
Then what you do is you use data mining, you do the sorting on here, and suddenly you see that pattern. I cheated a little bit here, but bear with me. Um, well, if we compare that pattern now and overlay it with what we had before, right? Those, those were the, the, the destinations that we looked at, and now we have the sources actually generating that pattern. Then I can take that and I throw it into some other visualization. In this case, I throw it in a parallel coordinate where on the left I see the source. So there's different sources connecting to that one destination that I showed you. And now I'm showing the ports also. So I'm adding more information to this. I should probably add more. I can add the number of bytes transmitted. I can add the time in here and so on. But I think you get the idea where now I can actually investigate and see, well, what actually did these guys do? And if you read this and think, think about it a little more, you notice that the different sources were used to, to scan different ranges of the ports to do sort of reconnaissance, but over a longer period of time, if you actually looked at the time frame here, you would see it's really hard to see this pattern in any other way if you just looked at, at, the, at the data itself. All right, and with that, I'm going to um, leave you for the break, I think. Um, happy to answer questions in the break because I'm totally out of time. Thank you.